everyone. Welcome to Humans of Wharton. Great to have everyone. And um, today we have a little powwow of old friends and, and uh, we're going to grill on the screen Mr. Pierre-Alain Riquet, um, a very good old friend. A, a couple of minutes of intro. Um, uh, Pierre-Alain is from Belgium. Belgium is a small country that's going to get beaten up by Portugal later today. That um, I'm probably going to eat my words later. But. Anyway, so he's he's a true a true a full bred Belgium um, professional. He's a lawyer by education, and I know that he traveled quite a bit. Um, a big fan of Asian culture, so he spent a lot of time in Japan. And then we met for the first time in a probably in a Lother meeting uh, when we both joined Lother. It's scary to say 17 years ago, Pierre. Yeah, that was right in 2002. Um, it was probably May 2002 when we met for the first time. Um, and yeah, it was a pleasure to meet you. We we had a lot of fun for two years, and uh, and uh, and yeah, I mean, it's great to have you here. And 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 we lived together with Diego in second year. I don't know if Diego, you want to say any words. That's right, housemates, 1908 housemates. Such a shame that Joao couldn't join. Because this was a, this was a, almost a sequel to the previous uh, episode where you guys were talking about that house and all the uh, all the things that happened and didn't happen at that house. Um, so it is uh, an honor to have been invited to join, to surprise you, to speak to you, and uh, really to have an opportunity to talk. Because life passes quickly, and before you realize it, if it wasn't for things like this, maybe another year would have passed and we wouldn't have had a chance to speak or even see each other. So thanks, uh, Olena, for... Uh, for uh, uh, organizing and Miguel for the little nudge. Hey Diego, why don't you join in? Nice to see you, Pierre. Alain. That that's awesome. Th thank you so much. And and first, well, you know, let let's give credit where it's due to Elena and Sean, who uh, I, I think this series is just amazing. It's just so nice, particularly I think coming out of the pandemic, where you know we haven't seen a lot of friends, or well, we've done a, we actually have done a couple of little video calls with, with Diego and Miguel, but no, no, certainly not enough. And just to be able to kind of join in conversation, like with. You know, I've, all the ones that I've looked at from, you know, Rodolf and Simla and Ronan and all, it's like, it's like catching up with them again. So it's, uh, and with friends that I think we probably all feel the same, but, you know, friends that you've made at, you know, at B-School are, they're lifelong friends. They're people you cannot see for maybe even 17 years and then you see them and it's like as if you were them, you know, yesterday. So, uh, so it's so nice. And obviously the, the surprise of getting both Miguel and Diego Joao, we didn't need him anyway, but I'm I'm kidding. But uh, uh, yeah, no, to to have you guys on, it's just it's just so nice. So uh, yeah, so so much to reminisce and to uh, and to think about, you know, years years also future and you know what life is going to bring to us and and our our, our children. I, I think it's amazing that you know Miguel met his my, you know beautiful wife Sonia uh, at school and and I did too. So I met Lisa. I, I still remember you, Pierlan single before meeting Lisa, when Lisa was a friend. I still remember that. Yeah. You remember, Diego, that once she made an apple pie and she came home and offered us cake and we were like, hmm, this is suspicious. Why cake for us? What did we do? I, I don't think she should ever listen to this. Thing. Le lemon pie. Lemon pie. You're right. Yes. It was a key lime pie. Key lime pie. And if, and if, she, hear, if she hears you mention that it was an apple pie, I think she might fly over and come and kick your butt. Anyway. <laughs> It's very particular about a key lamp pie. For, for those that are connecting that haven't been following your life as closely as Miguel and I have, give them a little bit of a yeah, a little bit of a summary of what you've been up to since graduating Wharton in two thousand four. All right, so uh, I, I'll do like a quick professional and then a quick private, or kind of it's going to intermingle. But so uh, so graduating in '04 uh, on the job front. Uh, and as you guys may remember, I tried investment banking over the summer as an intern. It was just god awful, and I was like, and that's actually what I think the you know what I was hoping to get into going into Wharton, but just didn't like it at all. And I was like, I'm not doing this. And so I ended up joining uh, a company called MBNA. Uh, if some of you remember, it was the largest credit card issuer, like independent credit card issuer in the U.S., hence in the world. That's a, you know, an American tendency. So if it's in the U.S., it's in the world. But I think it actually was at the time on a you know rotational management program, whatever. I did a couple of years there. First year in Wilmington, Delaware, so not really the booming metropolis, uh, and then got shifted or transferred to, to the U.K., and I was in Chester. Uh, and again, probably 
Chester was to the UK, what Wilmington was to the US. So not pretty exciting either. Uh, and long story short, you know, it was kind of, it was, it was reasonably interesting, but then the MBNA got acquired by B of A, uh, and they basically suspended all expansion globally and et cetera. And that's what I was basically hired, what I had been hired to do. Uh, and so I decided that's not what I want to do. I don't know what's going to happen here. And so I wanted to leave and, uh, the story get, gets much faster. Don't worry, because I tend to be long winded, but, uh, Basically, my boss sent a, my resume because I told him I was leaving and he sent my resume to the head of uh, B of A Securities. So the investment bank of, of B of A in London saying, hey, I got this guy. He's on banking. He was a corporate M&A attorney. And so two weeks later, I moved to London and I had a new job. And I was like, yeah, well, we'll see. I was not convinced it was going to be great either. But at least it enabled me to move back to London. And then that's where it meets the personal life. Lisa, so who had in the meantime graduated a year behind me, and we had actually gotten married. She was in Brussels with McKinsey, kind of waiting for me to come to the continent, which was the plan with MBNA. Uh, and I was in Chester, and then I said, "Hey, I'm going to London. Like, you know, get yourself, you know, move to London." And that's a great thing, with as probably Miguel knows, with you know, big consulting firms, they are, they can be pretty accommodating with with relocations of that kind. And so a month later, Lisa was in London, and so we both ended up in London. And life there was was great. We really loved it. We stayed for a year and a half, nearly two years. I again, I stayed in banking and in consulting. And at some point, because they said, "Oh, you've done, you've worked in credit cards, so you probably know payments," and I was like, "I have no idea what you're talking about." But uh, they asked me to start doing fintech, so financial technology. Uh, and then fast forward, so they they sent me to New York on a six month uh, secondment to work with a, a proper fintech team of people who knew what they were doing. Uh, that was in 07. And then I never came back. Uh, we, we both, so I moved for my job. Lisa again was able to relocate, uh, uh, with, with me. Uh, and we, uh, got to New York and lived in corporate housing and et cetera and all. And then I think really the, the real, the real, how could I say catalyst, uh, was that Alice was born. So our, our firstborn Alice was born when we were there in a way temporarily and and i think kind of our nesting instinct and mine as much as lisa's kind of kicked in and we were like you know we're here we're in new york it's great like why not when we stay here and then uh and then we stayed and so and and then and then that's it that's been our life ever since so i've changed you know companies a couple of times like it's pretty regular in in banking so went through the bfa merrill merger can talk to you about that i mean uh, i think uh, as a banker and i'm still Crazily enough, I'm still in banking. I think it's fair once in a while to go through one of these transactions, you know, that you usually work on. And when you say, oh, yeah, there's a line for like synergies and we're going to cut people, this and that. And and actually, when you go through that and you see the effect on, you know, people who get fired and et cetera. I mean, it's it's it was very enlightening to me, uh, not enlightening enough to the to make me change. But so so I still stayed in it. So anyway, so work wise, I've gone through then a couple of, of firms. I'm now at a firm called Teneo. Uh, we do a whole variety, of things, including banking, and I'm still a fintech banker. Uh, Lisa, and I'm talking about her as well. I mean, I think it's maybe of interest to some, uh, stayed at McKinsey for, I don't know, maybe 15 years or something, and recently changed. So she has now a new position in, uh, you know, in finance, at a, actually at a hedge fund, which she is, is enjoying a lot. And we, we lived in the city for about 10 years and, uh, and enjoy it uh, tremendously. Uh, and our, you know, our kids were born both in, in New York City and went to school in the city. And uh, and then one day we we discovered through a friend, uh, you know, a little place here called Larchmont, uh, just outside of uh, of New York and Westchester. And we realized, what have we been doing? We've been living in the city with kids, uh, you know, with all the, you know, not the issues, but the challenges that it can present. And and there's a place, you know, like on a 30 minute short commute, uh, that's right there where, where we could maybe go live. And, and, and I at the time, so Lisa had worked from home from, for a while and, and I would commute and we never wanted, we never considered that because we didn't want to be weekend parents. That was really a, a like a, a principle for us. We wanted to be around. We didn't want one of us to leave early in the morning before the kids get up and come back home, you know, after they've gone to bed. But then this commute was, it made it possible. So, uh, so we moved four, nearly five years ago now. We first rented a place because we were like, if we don't like it, if we're in the burbs and we don't like it, we want to be able to go back. 
and the first winner was a bit like drab. We were like, oh, this is, this, it's okay, but no. And we were like cheering up and, the, and our, Alice was not pretty happy because we we're like, oh, you know, you, you took me away from my friends and all. And to us, it was a bit the same, but, and then the first summer came in and it was like, we were sold. So, so, so one thing for everyone that knows Behind it, uh, one thing that everyone I think would probably identify spontaneously about you is the fact that you smile probably more than anyone I know. Always smiling. Always saw you smiling during Wharton, uh, even in moments of, of, of difficult times. And I have a question. You clearly look like you're still smiling today, many, many years after graduation, but more impressively, many, many years after investment banking. <laughs> so, so, so tell me a little bit, you know, you, you know, how do you do it? Are you also smiling all the, all the time at work? Did you think it was going to be this happy living you know, and working in investment banking all your life? I, I, listen, I, I don't know. To me, I think it's, uh, and, and it's going to sound corny maybe, but uh, I think I'm so lucky. And that's just me. I think most people around me, I think, are very lucky as well. We all have amazing life in so many ways. You know, we have no, none of the issues that other people face in their, in their life day to day. I live a very comfortable, happy, healthy, whatever life. I'm surrounded with people I love. Uh, I love, I love uh, social interactions. That's what kind of, that's what I really enjoy. And at work, when I'm happy is when I'm talking to either colleagues or, co or clients or counterparts or whatever, that also kind of, you know, we're, hey, well, we're all fine. You know, it's, I think it's going to be okay. And then you start from there and you can only build up. And the rest is like, you know, it's, it's pretty good. So to me, like I'm smiling today, like from ear to ear, because I'm here with like amazing friends that I've known for so many years, some that I've known for less time, but it's great. We're having a good time. And I don't know. I, so you're, so you're not one of those, you know, working at 3 a.m. all of a sudden, you know, working on a weekend, you still manage to find a way to, to put a smile on your yeah. face and, and look off. Yeah, listen, I mean, about that, I mean, I, I don't know, maybe I'm kind of, I'm, I got old enough and I hate to say that it's about banking, but uh, I'm sure there are places where people still work that or, or work that way. And to me, I've never appreciated that about about banking, right? That culture of like working to work, like working people to death. And also that kind of pyramid where, you know, you're at the bottom, you kind of, you know, you just eat it, right? And then, and then, and then you kind of kick stuff down the, 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 uh, come on, the rungs of the, of the scale or whatever. Uh, and, and, you know, at the bottom, you just eat it, eat it, eat it. And then you get to the top and, and you, you relax. And so I, I've never appreciated that about banking. I've kind of, I've actually, avoided and left places where it was the culture. I think now I've read a place where, listen, I'm, a, I'm, I'm not a partner at Goldman. I'd be the first one to admit. So, but I'm a, you know, I'm a senior guy at a firm where we're all happy to be there. Uh, we enjoy working with each other. We're not asking a junior analyst to do a, you know, 20, 50, 100 profile book on a Friday at 5 p.m. for a Monday meeting because it makes no sense. So, and to me, I, 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 I appreciate that. I mean, that, I think, I think, I think for some people, you know, life is about work and about what you achieve at work and et and all. I, I probably have a bit more of a, I'm trying to have a balance maybe. And so I, my weekends are, listen, if I need to work and run a deal, absolutely. And, you know, heads down and I work when I need to work, but also, you got to enjoy life. I mean, you know, you got to day by day. And, and I think, and if you can offer that to the people you work with, listen, I'm, I'm not saying it's a life philosophy, but uh, you ask me why I smile. Maybe that's why. I don't know. Um, I feel I'm constantly working, but at the same time, I'm like, I don't need to do anything right now. I'm like, you know, my phone is, I have my phone, my email, and all. I can, I can be on. Uh, uh, anyway. So it's possible. It's yeah. possible. There's hope for everyone. Investment banking with balance and smiles on your faces all the time. PA, one question. I, I remember past conversations in the old times, and you were one of the few people that always talked about starting its own business in a way. And I remember hearing from you, uh, I'm trying to remind all the ideas that we discussed, but I think at some point it was a restaurant, then there was a sports clothing line, which I think it was a fantastic idea. And you have been rich if you started 10 years ago a sports clothing line. Oh, at, at, at leisure for rich American women. That's right. And uh, <laughs> what, what happened? Is that, still, is, that, is that still something that you have kind of like thinking that you're going to do eventually? Or 
you kind of like put it on the side. How, how do you think about it? Listen, may, may, maybe, right? I mean, I, and, and, and I know it because I listened also to your episode, Miguel, and, and, and then we, you know, we guys talk and, and, uh, you know, I think you have kind of these stages in your life and in your career where you're like, you know what you're doing, you're head down and then you, uh, I think I'm, to me, you know, I mean, maybe two thoughts. One, excuse me, I'm, I'm happy with what I'm, with what I'm doing. I, I've kind of found a balance currently in my career where you know, things work and I, and I, you know, I know my, I kind of, I think I can say, I don't know if everybody agrees, I kind of know what I'm doing. I, I have relationships of people that I work with for a long time and, and I'm not saying the business comes to me like, like that because I'm, I'm, I'm who I am, but, and, and again, it's, and I'm saying this very, very humbly and modestly, but it's, you know, it's on the smaller end of companies and it's and all, but in my sector and I know them and I've talked to people for a long time. And I'm, when they want to do something, they call me and they say, Hey, can you help us? And, and I really, really feel very privileged about that. At the same time, uh, it's true that, that, uh, push or that desire to maybe create something have also more of an impact than just, you know, as I think Miguel, you said the same thing, right? Just help rich people make, make even more money. Uh, you know, kind of, it's true. Yeah. I mean, you, yeah, I, I feel that there's something more that I'd like to do and whether it is helping very young companies and startups and, you know, as I believe you do as well, you know, you invest a little bit and then you get on their board and stuff like that and all, and you help them. I really enjoy that a lot. That's really so much fun. Uh, creating something new and launching your own business or operation or whatever uh, is still also something, yeah, that, that I, that I, I would probably want to do someday. I think I'm thinking more about it now in, and maybe, I don't know, maybe more grown up terms. It's not like, Oh, I'm going to start a restaurant tomorrow. It's more, it's probably more in terms of how could I do it in a way that would be the most impactful. And it's not that I'm risk adverse, but I would want to do it in a way. I don't think, for example, I can start something from scratch on my own. I'm not the guy who's going to, you know, hold up in my garage for two years and come up and be like, ta-da, you know, I don't think that's me. But could I do it with other people or acquire a business and make it better? Or sure, it's like I'm probably more thinking of, of, of things, things like that. And, and I must admit, I have probably a bit of a, of a uh, I'm kind of waiting for it to kind of appear in front of me and be like, that's it. That's what I want to do rather than really scrambling to find it at this time. And then there's the whole aspect of we're, I'm so lucky, we're so lucky. Can I maybe do something also that would would be not only just for me to have fun or make money or whatever, but maybe make a difference. And and and, and I'm, you know, yeah, I'm I'm toying with all these thoughts and, and ideas and et cetera. And I, you know, hopefully someday something will 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 happen. So uh you brought up something that uh Elena and I like to ask a lot uh, about making an impact and making a difference. What is that to you? Like, what what kind of impact would you want to make? Like, what are some issues that you see that you want to, maybe want to get your hands dirty in? Uh, I mean, listen, again, I, I would say to, to each his own. And, and I think, you know, you can have very high ambitions of kind of changing the world and et cetera and all. I, I, I think I'm, I think everybody can make a difference at their own level, uh, kind of whatever it is. And, and I think the more maybe with age, I think I'm, I'm, I'm learning it's that where you can make the most impact is really, uh, I think it's probably where, you know, you're good at something or, 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 you know, you, you are, you, you have, you've developed competences and, and, uh, or relationships or whatever, and you can bring that to bear rather than say, for example, am I going to go and start a, you know, uh, what is it? The World Kitchen Organization that Jose Andres does, but as a chef of the sea, well, that's amazing for him. I would love to do something like that. Well, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm a chef. Yeah, I can cook, but I, you know, I can't do something like that. Now, should I go and work and build up like a finance organization that would do stuff for, I don't know, underprivileged families or something like that? Or, uh, I, 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 I don't know, I must say. Uh, you know, throughout the pandemic and all, there's like, you know, food collections and all in areas and you, you help with stuff like that. And you're like, okay, I'm, I'm helping and making a difference, but, uh, I don't know. I don't think there's one thing today that I'm thinking, well, that's what I'm again, a little bit as I was saying, maybe professionally. And, and maybe I might come out as being like, you're completely loosey goosey. You're never going to achieve anything because you're like, you're all over the place. It, but it's a bit like, like with work. And if I wanted to change and do something more entrepreneurial, 
And I think about a lot of things all the time, but at some point, I think I need to get that feeling like, hey, that's, that's maybe what I want to do and that's what I should be doing. But in the meantime, you know, there's so much that we can do. And I, well, I think we, we do a little bit, but uh, I could probably do more. So, so I, yeah, I'd like to find maybe a more structured way of, 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 of doing it and to have a more and a longer lasting impact for, for, for sure, for sure. So here's a, another question. Around this age, I think there will be cases of people that will have gone through or are going through a mini midlife crisis, um, or maybe it'll arrive a little bit later. It's kind of in this age between 40 and 50 that maybe people start to question things and think, you know, should I do some radical thing that I haven't done in the past? I don't know whether either of you on the call have gone through that, have any example of, this is my midlife crisis. You got to go ahead. <laughs> it's a great question. It's a great question. Um, I don't think I don't think I have gone through the crisis yet because I think I think and, and, and I was having talking to another friend about this the other day. I still have young kids and they take a lot of attention and and it's hard to have a crisis when you're managing others. And the lockdown has a little bit been like that, right? When you have two kids starting from home, you, you're hunkering down. You're like, wow, there's no way for my crisis because everyone else is struggling. So you're kind of like helping others. Um, so I guess I haven't had it yet, but, but, but there's elements of my life that I think about that you can think, it's not a super crisis, but you can think about it as, is what I do relevant? Should I do something else? Um, should I do something else? Uh, you know, you are like, shit, I, I might have 10 years, 15 years ahead of me. What, what should I do? Right? Like you, the typical thing about what you want to write in, in your biography. Um, is this relevant anymore? Or you know, like def definitely those are thoughts that I have. And, and uh, yeah, yeah, I think I was gonna say, I think the crisis is, you know, obviously I described it in the way in which it's usually known. Obviously crisis sounds like it's some dramatic, uh, uh, tragic accident or event that happens. No, I think you're right. It's less of a crisis, more of a kind of reflection point uh, where you do kind of take those moments to sit back a little bit and see where you are. You're probably you guys, all, both your kids are a little older than mine, uh, so you can probably start seeing them get into a certain age where you're like, wow, life has really passed quickly. It's been nearly 20 years since we've graduated from, from Morton. Amazing. Uh, so, so my kids are still four and two, so I, I haven't had as, as big of that moment. Um, but I can, you know, start to sense when you start asking yourself those questions and you think, all right, so what, what else can I do with the next phase of my life? No. Yeah, you, you both need to start getting ready for what I would call not my midlife crisis, but my kids' teenage crisis. Uh, my, they're getting to this age, and I'm saying that facetiously. My kids are great and, and we're sort of 13 and 10 now. Uh, but they're changing. They're changing so fast. And it's true. I think, Miguel, you're right. I mean, for the first, maybe a little this age and still listen, until they go to college, I think we'll feel that way. But and, and as a parent, I mean, that's, I think, on, on the planet, if you bring human beings on this planet, you'd better take care of them, give them roots and wings, right? That's, that's always the saying, right? You need to have them grounded and then give them enough autonomy and responsibility so that they can go on their own. But, but you need to be there. I think, I, I think Lisa and I, it's funny, we grew up on different sides of, of the planet, but we, we kind of had that same education of pretty present parents, quite strict. And I think we, we, that's probably what, what we are today. Uh, but that takes, yeah, that takes a lot of time and effort and focus. So as to my midlife crisis, I don't, I don't know, Lisa told me a few years ago, oh yeah, you've had a midlife crisis, you started gardening. And I'm like, okay, if, that, if, that, if that's what it is. And, uh, there you go, we found it, gardening. <laughs> and, uh, and I was growing vegetables in our previous house, not this one, and I, and I really enjoyed it. And I was like, this is great. It's like, that you know, definitely counts. Some guys buy a definitely. Porsche or a Ferrari, and then some guys like you know become philanderers and all. And yeah, my husband grows you know cucumbers and tomatoes, and uh, it was great. And uh, but I don't know. I listen to me again. I think a crisis usually comes at a point of inflection, of rupture, and all. And I'm again, I keep maybe saying it and somewhat stupidly, and you know, with like you know stars in my eyes. But you know, my life is great. Like I don't feel like I need to change that much. But but then again, it's probably more like, okay, I could change things and maybe not just for me, my family, us, people around me and all, but maybe, you know, others or whatever. And I, and I don't want to sound like, you know, like, like I'm that saint who only thinks about that, but, you know, I don't know. We'll, we'll, we'll see. Yeah. We'll see. 
you know, just another anecdote for people on the call. You know, I was thinking at some point I should run a marathon. I want to do this at some point before I get too old. But of course, you've run marathons. Did one or more than one? <laughs> How many I, did you run? I, I ran one. Well, the funny anecdote one. is so, so I go. married into a family of uh, really like overachievers from a, from a sports perspective. So my wife was a, was a varsity rower. Like, you know, her brother was a, a baseball player, was drafted. Her sister is an amazing tennis player. You know, and, and, uh, and her parents ran many, many marathons, both of them, including my wife's mom, and I'm sure she wouldn't mind me saying this, who has actually a, a lung condition and all. So she, she ran on like 30% lung capacity and she's done Boston and all. I mean, it's, it's just amazing. So when we got married... And we were talking about it, you know, and I, I'm okay. I'm reasonably fit, but not, I, let's, let me say it this way. I love eating and drinking. So, you know, uh, but then she said, no, anybody can do a marathon. If, if you're, if you're physically able, you can run a marathon. Like you, Miguel, you, Diego, Sean, Elena, we can, anybody can run a marathon. And I was like, yeah, right. And then, and frankly, I, I, I would say, I, well, I did it. So we train for it. I think if you train systematically and you do it with somebody who's done it before, maybe that, that clearly helped. But the funny thing, and sorry, again, long-winded way to come to my anecdote, I crossed the finish line of that thing, which, by the way, I crossed on, on my own because Lisa had a knee problem. So we come to mile 16 of New York. You know, you cross the Queensboro Bridge, you get to Manhattan. You have to go up First Avenue and all. It's, it's dreadful. And we get there, mile 16. Her pants are there. My pants are there. And Lisa kind of collapses. She's like, I cannot continue. My knee is just like busted and I got to stop. And I'm like, yes, we're done with this thing. And I'm like, okay, let's pack up. Let's go home. And then, oh, no, no. They all look at me, particularly Lisa's parents. They look at me and say, oh, no, no, off you go. We'll finish this thing. And I'm like, I, what is happening? I, I don't want to run another 10 miles on my own. Long story short, I did it. And then at the finish line, my father-in-law was there, shook my hand, and said, welcome to the family. <laughs> All right. That, that, that was 14 years ago. And what is the funny thing with the pandemic and working from home? I've gone back to running. So I run four, five, six times a week now. Not long distance, but uh, it's great. But, uh, Diego, you, you, sh you are in so much better shape than, than I am and probably than I've ever been that I will ever be. So you, your marathon is like... Did you have did you have a two year old and a four year old at the time of training for the marathon? No, no, so no. Well, you're, that's a good point. This is my this is my that's, that's a good point. Point. That's a good point. That's why I don't play golf, for example. I don't know if any of you do, but it, it's just except that's time consuming when you have kids. Like, forget it. Although I'm getting to an age where my kids now like to do stuff without us. Right? It's really interesting. They, you know, for the first what I would say ten, twelve, whatever years, you, you need to provide activities, right? And organize stuff for them and all. And, and, and they want to be with you and do stuff with you. And my daughter is getting at an age where she's like, yeah, I, I, I'd rather be with my friends than with you guys. And so it's, uh, and it's natural. And, it's, and at first you get kind of offended. You're like, what? I mean, like, you know, am I chopped liver or, I mean, you, you know, but, but, uh, but it's funny. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. How have, let, let me, let me ask you guys a question. How, how have, kids changed your lives what what like i know when you when you're like it, there's the you're elated to be a father all right i guess you probably have that feeling of it and you love them and all and then you realize oh my god my life as i know it is over right and and then but then you find a new balance and then so how how has it affected you guys i mean and to what extent no, no you go first <laughs> No, no, no. You were, you were a father first. You've got more that's years right. of experience yeah. than I, I mean, uh, my quick answer is uh, massively. That, that's probably the, singlest, the single event that most changed my life. And, um, and, I, and when I went through it, I always felt if, if women don't have a day. I mean, maybe they have a day, but it, it feels like a gradual way of going into becoming a mother. And when, when birth happens, it's almost like they are... I don't want to say this because it might become sexist, but I, I felt, at least my experience with Sonia, that she she became a mother. It, like she changed and became a mother. For 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 that is different because for you is you're the same, and one day you show up in the hospital and something pops up, and you're like, "What do I do with this?" And, and suddenly it's there, 
and, and I think your that your journey as a dad starts later, and 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 it's just a massive massive change. So so yeah, I mean, for me it's interesting because so that happened, my life changed completely, but I've been thinking a lot about life post kids. And I don't know if he, I feel like and maybe Diego. Now you jump in and you, how if you relate to this, but I feel like I'm a, I'm in a in t- middle of a generation of kids that are growing up at 13 years old, and I have my parents which live without kids and haven't seen their grandkids a lot, and that evolution, and I'm kind of like seeing it's almost like a movie that you see in yourself in 15, 20 years, and you're still dealing with kids, and you're like, okay, how do I manage this? So it's, it's, it's an interesting thought. What, what do you think, Jim? Yeah, I thought, I mean, I, the way I describe it to people, I mean, I, I had, I got married late and I had kids late. So I had kids when I was 40 years old. Uh, I think when I was young, if you had asked me, I would have said I would have kids when I was 24, 25. I was always very romantic, falling in love everywhere I go. And I thought everything would, would happen very quickly. And then at the end, there was a moment where I actually thought, maybe I won't get married, maybe I won't have kids, and I'm okay with that. So it took, it took me some time to get back to uh, thinking about getting married and having kids. And I say the same thing about both of them. I think both of them, I was, I wouldn't say I was scared about them, but at that point, I wasn't needing them. I wasn't like, um, when I was younger, I had my life planned out and I thought this was obviously going to happen. So if it didn't happen, then I would be a little bit less, a little bit more frustrated with it not happening. At that point, I wasn't frustrated with any scenario. I could get married or not, or have kids or not. Um, but when I did get married... And when I did have kids, both of the experiences were far better than I could have imagined. And, and, I, and I described especially the kids one as the matrix. So the matrix is like, all of a sudden you're used to living life normally, and life is good. But then all of a sudden you have kids, and it's like you all of a sudden now see the matrix. And you see life in a completely different uh, uh, combination, and like another parallel universe is happening. And all of that just changed the moment that you had kids. So yeah, and obviously it's it's a uh, it's something that I that I recommend to everyone, but not in a way that it's the only way. Uh, people can be happy with kids and without kids, but the uh, but the diversity of experience that it gives you to have kids, and of course the sense of purpose and the, the sense of pride, uh, I don't think can be replicated without having kids. You ate the blue pill. <laughs> exactly. Do not eat the blue pill. <laughs> Life was so simple. Piala, what do you remember the most about Wharton? I don't know. I don't think it's one thing. I think it's just that... uh, I was going to say whirlpool. It's not the right word. It's like the... the intensity uh, of these two years on so many levels. Uh, I, I don't think I've ever been that busy in my life doing equivalent professional things, right? I mean, anyway, going to class, well, if I can say, I mean, I was, I was a curry switcher. So, so I kind of had to kind of work to learn some of the stuff because I came in as a continental European lawyer who basically knew, you know, I know what Excel was. I'm not sure I'd opened it before coming to Wharton. Uh, and Wharton is pretty quantitative. So, and that's why, that's why I went there. I mean, one of the reasons. And so it was pretty hardcore for me. I mean, I'm, I remember we had the class with Dalil. You remember, <laughs> Miguel, the law class that everybody hated at Lauder. And I was like, oh my God, a law class at last. And we had a paper and I wrote like 20 pages. Like, well, I didn't know. Like, oh, I hated amazing. it. I hated yeah. it. Everybody hated it. I, mean, I was like, well, thank you. Because yeah, of the it. core, I couldn't, I couldn't, I think I waved what, one thing, business law or whatever. I was like, yeah. Uh, but so that was, it was the intensity on that side. And then it's, it's funny. I had that approach that I had also have had, sorry, when, when I, one of the times I, I lived in Japan, and I told myself, you know, if you don't want to miss anything of this experience, just say yes. When you're offered to do something, just go for it and kind of try it out. Now, it can sound pretty, you know, I'm not saying stupid, but, you know, not very, or a bit carefree, especially in an environment where there's so much going on that, you know, you need to be somewhat selective. Uh, but it had worked for me when I was in Japan. And so I was like, okay, well, let me start like that at Warden. And so the, the number of clubs and activities and, and, uh, and you know, I, 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 I can't believe I was, I, I even did rowing. We, we, you remember the second year we were, we were. I remember you were waking up at 5 a.m. 
We were like, you're crazy, dude. What are you doing? What was I thinking? It was just insane. We were having parties at the house. I was working with Lauder. And I'd taken that class that I thought was phenomenally interesting, which it was. But the guy had, had us read like literally two books a week on political science and stuff like that. Like, and you were doing your thesis on Japan's World War II oh or something, God. right? I remember that. No, the thesis was actually on poverty alleviation, but I, I had to do it actually over the summer, if you remember. Because also, oh, you can go to Singapore with INSEAD. I'm like, sign me up. That sounds awesome. <laughs> and so I finished my second year at, at INSEAD in Singapore, which was a blast. But then right into my thesis, I kind of had a very good time in Singapore and, and – uh, And so I, I kind of pushed back my effective graduation because I, I, I sent in my thesis from court late. And it was, it, it was actually, uh, you know, it was afforded to us. They told us, oh, if you're going to Singapore, you can, you can send your thesis in later. And so I, I effectively got my diploma in, uh, in, uh, in August. The really so that's funny, why you went. That's why you went. <laughs> yeah, that, extension <laughs> on the thesis. No, no. Here's, here's the funnier thing. So graduation, if you guys remember, right? So we had all our families come in and we, it was super nice, right? For our parents to meet. And it was, I think these were very, very special moments. But I had to explain to my parents that actually I was going to walk in that stadium, the whole thing and all, and receive an empty envelope, right? So I was participating in graduation, but not really getting my diploma yet because I wouldn't get Wharton either. It was like both of them were commingled. And so you get both, right? Or none. And so because I didn't finish my thesis, I was not getting, I was just getting two empty envelopes, but participating in the whole, you know, fiesta, if you want. And then when they came, if you remember, they came to visit the house. And I think the... Well, the I don't want to really of just, wisdom, of tranquility. Yes. There exactly. was a Buddha in the entrance, exactly. it's true. There was a and Buddha. And they saw the Zen garden, and then and they were like, oh, you funny lineman. But then they turned back and then they saw, you know, the bar that had that uh, shutter. I think it was actually open. And my dad looked at me and said, looks like he must have been having a good time for these two years. So I, you know, I, I kind of want to see the diploma of yours when it gets in. <laughs> Just in case, you are sure you're going to get a diploma, right? Is that what he said? You are sure. <laughs> You know, I, I had always been a responsible guy and I think my parents trusted me and all, but I think at that point, maybe in their life, that's the moment when I'm sure they had like, you know, they, they, they missed a heartbeat. They were like, I'm pretty sure your dad you was son? like, rock on, that's my son. I was like, yeah, <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, you know, I got, I got asked a similar question the other day. I joined uh, one of these Wharton, they have a thing called the Wharton Global Youth Program, which apparently these are high school students that they enroll in like a summer, a few weeks of uh, uh, prep for college. Um, and I spoke for about 30 minutes about basically Wharton people that end up not in traditional careers. Uh, and I got the question of what is the most important thing or the best thing about Wharton that you remember? Tough questions, though, you know, because you, because like you said, there's so many things that come to mind. It's difficult to call out one. Um, but I ended up talking about the community, which is a very overused word. No, uh, you hear community all the time. I talk about community all the time. Yeah, I talked about it when I was in digital and social media. Then I talked about it in football uh, a lot. Uh, but it really is, for me, the best word to describe the best thing about work. No, because you're around all these people that are, uh, you know, international, um, you know, super smart, uh, take life as seriously as they take work. Um, So, like, just really embrace everything that like you said. They just, you know, they jump into everything and everything they want to do, you know, at the fullest of their, of their capability. You know? and, and being in that space for two years where every day is some new experience is, is impossible to replicate in life ever again. I could be. No, yeah, I so mean, you're, 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 yeah. go ahead. If we think about some of the other memories of those times then, and let's talk about the house a little bit, you know, the, the, <laughs> the, 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 the legendary house. Um, obviously, you know, people remember people that came to the house remember the parties. Uh, clearly, there were there were many. Um, I particularly remember the last one where we um, put all around the house printed black and white photos of all of the parties that we had had throughout the year, and then everyone on arrival was given a yellow smiley face sticker that we put on their heads. Do you guys remember this? And they became the thing of the party. Everyone was just happy, throwing uh, happy face stickers on everyone. 
and it was the it was the big farewell party uh, for that house. But I also remember the first party, and most importantly, the first invitation to the party. <laughs> Do you guys remember this? <laughs> it was um, it wasn't it the one that had like space is the ultimate luxury. That's yes, the one. Yes, it, yes, yes, yes. That was the one. And, and this was your was doing. Was your Listen, it was my my creative side. I don't know where. It's, <laughs> I, I I don't know where it was before, and I don't know where it's gone since. But uh, yeah, I I don't know why what what happened to me. I and I created these video invitations. The uh, video. Built up, build, build up to. Uh, yeah, it was anyway. But it was yeah, it was. Uh, uh, I used whatever, like a Windows Media Player thing. It was kind of like, uh, you know, slides and all. And then after that, it was little movies and all. But it was... Uh, it's, it was I, I don't have them, by the way, anymore. You, you, do you guys have them? Say I something? bet I could find it. I'd have to go into some hard drives, but I bet I could find yeah, it. Yeah, me too. Yeah. I man. remember we were just like... you. We were amateurs at this. Like, all right, let's organize a party. Who should we invite? And then all of a sudden, yeah, uh, I was like, let's send this as, a, as an invite. And I was like... Yeah. I would not say we were amateurs at parties, but... I think we had we had a bit of experience, maybe not at yeah. There are no. Anyway, but you took was, it to another level with that invitation. I, <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't. I think you did the next one, didn't you, Miguel? Did I? Good times. Did I? Good I think time. you did the next one or the one after that. But I remember you like, I want to know how to do this. <laughs> I'm going to do one of these. Days. No, I remember Perlan was kind of like the, the artistic director. He had the vision. He would be like, yes. and then the themes. I don't know yeah. how we came up with the themes, but it was kind of like. Um, we had a Cuban party that was really good. You remember we had, Havana? We had an 80s party. I remember the 80s party oh. with the VHS. We rented the VHS with Star Wars in black and white. And The 80s was amazing, too. Um, we had La Noche in Havana. What else? We had, and then we had birthday parties, right? We had Joao's birthday party. I remember the invite for that. Yeah, we had there was Diego's a bit of birthday, birthday party as well. That was, I remember Diego, everyone singing happy birthday. It was like 300 people singing happy birthday to Diego. It was kind of like impressive. I remember that. I get that all the time. <laughs> all the time. Every year. But I, I told you about that episode, right? When, so we graduated, we all left, but well, we, I stayed because I was working in, in, uh, in Wilmington. So I, I lived in Philly for another, I'm sorry, for another year and was dating Lisa, uh, at the time. So we won't have to go through the whole story. You, of what you happened, were like the godfather, how, right? Yeah, so we, well, we. I don't. I don't think the guy, so Aldo, and anyway, the crew that we handed the house over to. I don't think they knew that I was still there, but it didn't really matter. So Lisa gets invited to the first party at the house, so the reopening party. And she's like, "Oh, we should go." And all. I'm like, oh, "Okay, all right, whatever." So, so we get there, and <laughs> I'm serious. <laughs> it was like out of a movie. They like stopped the music. You got at a microphone, and they said, "It was like The Godfather." Like. As if I had been officially sent by that, I think they really thought that we, like the four of us with Joao, had decided, hey, we need to go and like help them, you know, christen this thing and have a representative <laughs> and be there officially and all. They were like people, sh like you know, hugging me and and I'm, I'm not say kissing my hands, but like, oh my god, like you know, it's like he's come out, like you know, the the, the second coming of. <laughs> I was like. The, the official weird. ambassador. We sent the ambassador over <laughs> to do the opening. Hey, let me let me switch gears. I, I, I have a question that that I, I think would be. I would love to hear your your thoughts and on and, and because I think we're all a little bit in the same situation or kind of. Uh, we, we're raising bicultural or multicultural uh, kids, right? I know you certainly mean uh, uh, Miguel with Sonia. You, Diego, I know it is also uh, Spanish originally, but you live in the UK and it's, I don't know, obviously I'm Belgian with an American wife. What, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it, I find it fascinating. Uh, what, do you find it challenging? Do you find it rewarding? What, how, how does, how does it work for you guys? You go ahead, Diego, you start. Now I was going to say the, um, for me, I mean, obviously I, I've grown up a very international life. And I would still say less than Miguel's, um, but uh, but for me, um, if it wasn't particularly international in terms of my home, um, it would feel odd. I think that would feel more odd than than being raised in you know, a kind of multicultural and multi uh, multinationality and multilingual environment. That feels supernatural uh, to me. Um, but um, in fact, I, I think I may have the opposite happen. Maybe you know we've been here now for. Eight years. Obviously, my, my kids have only have all have both been born uh, in the UK. Uh, they still clearly speak Spanish, and they feel very very um, uh, multinational. But you know, 
people who would stay here for five years or more, then maybe I'm going to start thinking that they are too, um, too, too English and not global enough. And how do I, you know, bring that back into their experience? Yeah, I mean, definitely resonate with that. Um, actually, I, I feel lockdown has um, forced us to be in one place, and it feels a little bit awkward. I, I you know, like I, I kind of like travel very little for the last year and a half, and it just doesn't feel normal. So we're trying, we're trying to plan to be two months in France, and then we're going to stop by Spain and Portugal just for them to, because they're losing their French, they're losing their Spanish, and Portuguese is, is almost minimal. You know, like so, we're gonna we're gonna go into it now a little bit of a push to to be less English. Um, so yeah, but but it's very normal to be like, I don't know. For me, I don't even think about it. It is what it is, and that's life. And um, you know what? It's it's. I hope. I mean, hopefully, no. I believe it's going to give them a better perspective of what the world is. But uh, I do already think a little bit around. Like I fast forward, and I think many many years out. But once they get into their own adult hold and their own choices, uh, and I think about what does a multinational experience mean in terms of keeping a family together uh, and not being too far away. Um, you know, obviously, it's still very early to think that, but uh, but one loves being part of this family unit now. Uh, that you want it to stay together, you want everyone to be close. Um, so I do think about that sometimes. You know, what, what is that? What is the bug that we're putting in our kids, which is going to make them want to always kind of you know, move around? I've moved around every three or four years. I think this is the time actually that I've lived more consecutively in one country my entire life, and it's the UK, which is actually the country that you know, I, I least would have said that I would have settled in. Um, you know, but we are in, in the end putting this uh, travel bug or this uh, you know, change bug into into our kids that feels like, as Miguel was saying, like it feels odd to be at home that long now. One kind of needs it, um, and I do think you know what what is that going to mean for for the stability of the family unit at some point when I don't want them to go very far. And the thing is, you know, with all the degrees that we have and all of that, and you know, there's no. What fascinates me is that. There's no school for parenting, right? You you kind of see what your parents did, and if you're if you're happy with it, you kind of emulate it. If you're unhappy with it, you change it. But there's nobody telling you like, oh, do this, do that, and that's gonna work or not. And it's like it's trial and error, and it's kind of crazy because you're like, these are my kids. They're like my 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 legacy, and you know, and and I'm responsible for them. And in, uh, ultimately, to me, maybe my my biggest achievement in life will be the day when I think to myself, my kids are me. I, I and I think it kind of already, but in a different way, but you know, like that they blossom into a responsible, caring, uh, I don't know if they need to be high achieving or even cure cancer. I mean, if they do great, but they don't do that. But are, are they good persons at the end of the day? And if my kids are good persons, man, I've, my, my, my mission on this planet is kind of done, right? I've left it hopefully a little bit better than when I came, when I came and, then, and then I'm leaving it with people who hopefully will do a little bit of good. Uh, I, I think that is a good way to close because if I had to say, you know, based on, you know, Miguel, you and I, we know Pierre Alain very well, we know Lisa very well. I think if we were betting people, which we aren't, I think, but if we are betting people, I'm pretty certain that we would put a pretty big bet on your kids being pretty good people. So, uh, mm-hmm. so keep on, keep on doing uh, the job that you're doing. I'm sure, and you, and they'll they'll make you proud. Thank you. Please don't send us to Mars. <laughs> <laughs> on Elon Musk's vessel or whatever. <laughs> hey, it was awesome. it was so great to see you guys, John and Elena. Thank you so much for uh, for I, I'm going to say the opportunity. It's like I mean, it's great that it's on Humans of Warden, but it's just it's just so nice to reconnect with uh, with you guys and to have a good a good chat as usual. Of course, definitely, yeah. Sean. N- nice meeting you. Nice meeting Thanks. you guys as, as well.